All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are in chapter or unit three now. Uh, we, we get done with the French and Indian War. And with the war, the British have won double the size of their land. So the British actually double the size of the colonies. They can go all the way to the Mississippi River. And the Indians, like it says at the top, are upset because from 1761 to 1763, they waited for an invitation to go to the peace process, and they were not invited. Now, the Indians were, again, told at the beginning of the war that they would get stuff after the war, depending on who won. So they are not happy, and violence may ensue. So what happens is that Pontiac, an Ottawa Indian chief, decides that with 14 tribes of Indians, so he goes tribe to tribe in a way, and tries to get more support, and the Indians agree to fight with him like a giant army. So Pontiac, being in Ottawa, and then all these other Indian tribes, agree that they're going to capture eight English forts in the Ohio Valley, basically showing the British that they are an army if need be. And what happens is they attack and capture six of the eight. They actually take over six of the eight forts by using crazy tactics. Again, they can't fight. They don't have uh, cannons. So what they do is they try to sneak into the fort. So one way they did that is while playing the game of lacrosse, uh, their women and children brought blankets with them, and when they were sitting there, as the lacrosse game kind of magically moved inside the magic, when the when the lacrosse ball was kind of thrown inside the inside of the fort, all the men kind of ran inside to the fort to continue the game, and their w women and children came in with their blankets. Lo and behold, inside the blankets were their weapons. Once they got inside the fort, they went to the blankets and just kind of ransacked everybody inside the fort. Another fort that they do capture... They actually send a girl out in the middle of the night outside the fort walls, and the British notice this little Indian girl that's kind of crying and sad, and I'm not sure if they kind of made her covered in blood or made her look like she was hurt. And when the British opened the doors, in came the Indians, and again, they swarmed in and they kind of took over the fort that way. So if you look, two of the forts, Fort Pitt and Fort Detroit, are not captured, two of the main ones. And the rebellion ends in 1763 when the Treaty of Paris is signed and the Indians lose their French allies or their French kind of supplies. So the French aren't there anymore to give them weapons and help. So the Indians kind of back away from this idea that one huge army could defeat the British. Moving on. Uh, the proclamation of 1763 is passed by the king. He's the bad guy. King George III. And he makes the colonists mad. It's kind of like Christmas morning where you wake up and you have all these presents. Now, the colonists have all this new land to go to. They're super excited. They've won this land. They helped fight. And now they have all this new land doubled the size of the colonies that they could go, you know, kind of resupply themselves and get new farmland and new money. So right away, the king makes a rule that no one, no colonist, could live west of the Appalachian Mountains. So even though they have the land, he's going to stop them from going there. And it's this land is now for the Indians. So in a way, the Indians are happy but to the colonists. So one of the things the British are doing while this kind of proclamation occurs is that the British army is kind of using what they can to try to wipe out the Indians or keep pushing them west. And one of the things they do is kind of like early germ warfare. And what a guy named Jeffrey Amherst does, he hates Indians so much that he's giving smallpox infested blankets, basically blankets of people who had died with smallpox, folding them up, making them look nice, and then giving them to the Indians. So within a year or two, People are getting sick and people are dying. Like thousands, by the thousands, smallpox would kill the Indians. So, in a way, do the British. All right, now to pay for the war, the big idea or the big argument right now is who will pay for this war that they just fought. Now, the English won, and that's huge, and they're getting all this new land. But England itself, the country, is in a huge debt from fighting the war, not just in Europe, but in America. So Parliament, the lawmaking body, and English, or the English, believe the colonists should pay for the French and Indian War. Because England paid for the war, paid for the soldiers to come over, paid for that, paid for that big fight. Now the colonists had a chance to actually pay for this. And going back to the last chapter, I can't really remember because I'm getting old. When that colonist, when the colonist group had a chance... Oh, now I remember. They had the chance with the Albany plan, but they all voted it down. So, in a way, the king and parliament take it out on the people by not by voting this idea down. And the king said, look, you're going to pay for the war because I defended your people. Number one basically says the colonists think the English fought the war to help you. You know, if you're England or you're the king, you wanted the colonies because they provide you with money. So the king had to protect the colonists to get more money for him. So that's what he wanted. So the English actually benefited more by this war than the colonists did. So in a way, just like you and your parents, think this way. You and your parents might not be getting along at this age because you're starting to become independent, thinking that 
you can do things on your own and you don't need to follow their rules because you're an adult and you know what you're doing. So to your parents, they still think that you're just like a grown-up baby. So your parents kind of treat you a little worse because again, you're trying to push those boundaries. So it's kind of the same system. The king is treating his colonies like kind of bad kids and the colonists are looking at the king like a really a parent that they don't like and don't want to follow anymore. Now, since the king makes the rules and parliament, they start to produce taxes or acts that will make the money back from the war. So two types are indirect taxes. An indirect tax is something that's added back in England to make the money or price of goods go up or down. So to give you an idea today, an indirect tax would actually cause the price of gasoline or milk or food to go up or down. So you don't actually see what's happening, but you know the price of gas, for instance, goes up or down almost every day. So that's an indirect tax. You just know the prices are going up, probably up more than not, but usually the price goes up on things, and that's because of an indirect tax. So three of the types that they had were the Sugar Act, which actually placed the tax or uh, an act or placed a tax on sugar or molasses that was imported from South America. So because this is an imported good, and all the all the colonists use sugar to sweeten things, that this was tough to get. So you had a lot of people in the colonies who own boats who would go down to South America on their own and smuggle goods in, meaning they would bring goods in illegally, sell them cheaper or sell them for free. Now to compare that to something today, you guys are used to smuggling in a way music on the internet. You know, if you find music that you want, you don't exactly always have to pay for it, which makes it a little illegal. But smuggling is kind of like that today. So back then again, they couldn't afford sugar, they needed it, so they found ways around that. Uh, the Currency Act is another act. This is a double kind of double dipping tax where the king made all his taxes have to be paid in gold or silver and when you paid you went to a custom house or a tax house and because you had to pay gold or silver for your taxes you had money that looked like this on the bottom. All 13 colonies had their own kind of paper money but to the king that was worthless. He wanted gold or silver because that was good everywhere. So in order to get the gold or silver, you had, to tra you had to trade your money for gold or silver. So it was kind of like an exchange. Well, with that, there's an exchange rate. The king would say, well, in order to get $5 from me, you have to pay $6 and I'll give you $5 worth of gold or silver. So you pay me the extra dollar because it's a tax. In return, then you're turning around and paying your tax money off with that gold or silver. It's kind of a genius idea in a way. So good for the king. Uh, the quartering act is last, where the colonists had to pay a tax also on having to food, having to provide food or shelter for any British soldier that would help out people on the frontier. So you're actually paying taxes on things where at any time a uh, soldier in the army could come and stay at your house. So maybe if they thought you were smuggling goods, they decided to send a soldier to kind of stay with you to make sure that wasn't going to happen. All right, the other type of taxes are called direct taxes. Now, these are taxes where the colonists actually see them having to pay in front of their face. So just like you guys, if you're used to paying a tax today, if you buy something at Best Buy and it's $9.99, you go to the counter and you have to pay a tax plus the good to get out of the place. So imagine back then one of these stamp or one of the acts is the Stamp Act of 1765, which taxed anything paper product-wise. So playing cards, newspapers, books, wills, everything had to have one of these two kind of stamps. They had each each little tax house or custom house had their own stamp and you had to get it stamped. So you bought the newspaper, turned around, and then had to pay again for a stamp to be placed on it to make it legal. Now if you did not have that stamp, you would have to, of course, serve the consequences or suffer the consequences. So again, anything paper had to be stamped. Uh, you have the Townshend X, which again, is all these things are all happening almost in order. Now this text, paint, glass, lead, paper, and tea, which are all things that, again, were tough to get to the colonies. They couldn't make them here, which made them tough to be smuggled in. So these are, again, things that you would need every day, especially tea. That was the drink of choice back then. Now, these things being taxed hurt the colonists because, again, now you're starting to not be able to afford goods. And if you didn't support the king, you didn't want to buy products that gave him money. All right. Now again, you get the idea that both the king and colonists don't like each other, kind of like you and your parents may be fighting over rules or different kind of chores you might have to do. Well, the colonists come up with two different things. One thing they do is they, they come up with a saying called no taxation without representation. Their big argument is that they are not represented in parliament. No members of the colonies are over in England 
representing what's best for the colonies. So Parliament and the king are making rules for the colonists with no one there to speak on their behalf, which makes the colonists angry. And their saying is no taxation without representation. They also agree to make, or they also have nine of the 13 colonies meet and agree not to import any goods from the from the king. So basically they're not bringing in any goods that will make them money or that will actually make the king money. So in a way, yes, it hurts the colonists, but it hurts the king more. So when this happens, the king puts out a declaratory act, a statement saying that the British king and parliament have the rules and law to make any rule and any tax or act they want. And the people have to go along with it. So it's kind of like you guys arguing with your parents that their rules are unfair and them telling you basically, when you live under my house, you follow my rules. But see, for me as a parent, I totally agree, and it makes my kids sound like this. Okay, but if you notice that by doing these things, or by repealing things, or by kind of fighting back against the king, the king actually does pull back sometimes, and he does repeal the Stamp Act, but that's just one act or tax that he took away. Uh, lastly, People were tarred and feathered. Another thing that people are doing to kind of protest or revolt against the king, they are tarring and feathering people that are kind of like loyalist or loyal to the king. So you have pictures down here to represent what that looked like, whether they poured hot oil on you or put molasses, and then they would dump, they would dump uh, feathers on top of you. Now, why do you think they would do that? To make you look like a... If you said chicken, you are absolutely right. If you said look like a horse, you need to look up what those look like. Um, you would do this outside a custom house where the tax collectors worked and where you would pay your taxes. So you took people who were just like jovial and happy that they would pay their taxes. You would grab them, tar and feather them, tie them to a tree so everybody can make fun of them. Uh, this was one of the things, again, that you could do to revolt against those taxes, to show the king we're not going to pay your dumb taxes. All right, another thing the king does is put a writs of assistance out, which is basically a blank search warrant for anybody to search any, sorry, any colonial soldier, any soldier working for the king, or anybody really working for the king, could search any British person whenever they want for whatever. So you have people like su suspected of smuggling, where the king could send people to search your house at any time for anything. So it was kind of unfair, and today we actually create a fourth amendment which protects you from illegal searches and seizures against that. So go America. And last but not least, you have America's first street gang, which is called the Sons of Liberty. These men uh, were the big rioters at the time. They would lead riots, burn tax buildings down, tar and feather people to show the king we don't need you. They were starting the. They were the ones that really started to talk about maybe America becoming independent. You have the women's group called the Daughters of Liberty as well. Um, the Sons of Liberty. My question for you before we stop for the day is something to ponder while you go to bed tonight if you're thinking about history, which is kind of weird, but say you were. Uh, the Sons of Liberty, men who are going against their own government, men, men who are fighting against the king, who even though in our minds they're heroes, they're Americans. But at the time period, given the fact they are English living in the colonies, could they be considered terrorists? All right, hopefully you guys took some notes. See you tomorrow.